Hi guys, can you hear me? Well, Nick, they probably do actually make some really, really, really easy to use software and I'm just dumb, honestly, and can't figure it out. But anyways, you guys can hear me A-OK. -okay. You can see me A-OK. -okay. Everything is working fine. That's a yes from Sean. Cool. Okay, we'll give it just a little bit more in case like a few other people wanna just kind of jump on real quick. Um, one of the problems that I am having with uh, this new um, uh, software and with streaming in general is that I'm still not quite able to figure out how to get a decent mic audio and amp audio and i know in my heart of hearts it's not because of how the software is it's because i'm still a newbie at this i'm still a novice at this so it's like every time i think i'm making a little bit of headway i just completely uh am missing the mark a little bit so not uh, uh, for one reason or another, either the levels aren't right or I'm getting like some really ridiculous phase. So unfortunately, that's kind of all the guitar you're going to hear on this for the moment. But that's all right. I mostly just wanted to wax eloquent on a few things anyway. So... Hello everyone, how's it going? I see Dennis is on here, Lucas, uh, hi from Greece, thank you so much, hello back to you. Message retracted, whatever that means, okay, whatever. Okay, so... Why is that not showing shit? All right. Now I'm seeing things. Okay. That's working a little bit better now. All right. So let's see where to start. I think what would be the best place to start is let's crack open a beer. So I've got this in my little beer fridge that I have here. I uh, have a few different beers from this brewery. This is from Belgium, and this is known as Mocha Bomb Black Damnation. So I'm pretty positive this is going to be something super chocolatey. Um, let's see... Yeah, Belgian Stout Ale, 2016 Vintage. This is nice and aged already. This is going to be pretty, pretty damn good. Pouring it into my new Pine House Pizza glass, since I live here in Austin now. The Pine House Pizza stuff is pretty damn good. God damn, that's got... Uh, a thick, rocky, tan head. Rocky heads are usually a very, very good sign that your beer is uh, very, very good stuff. So if it's a little bit more consistent of a head, uh, usually it was made a little bit more cheaply. Bet you guys didn't know that. But anyways, cheers to you. Let's taste this motherfucker. Very dark chocolatey, a little bit fruity in there. Like, I taste like some black fruits, like maybe just a little bit of like grape or blackberry, but extremely dark chocolatey. Mm. Good. 
kind of creamy, kind of smoky, actually. So it's a very, very, very rich stout with a very complex flavor. This is really, really good. I have a feeling I'm going to be kind of going through this bottle over the course of the stream. So this might get interesting. <clears throat> All right. Anyways, so. Okay, so play grindcore. <laughs> All right, there you go. There's an entire grindcore double album right there. So um, let's talk a little bit about some stuff. Ooh, so my air conditioner just kicked on. How's that sounding to you guys? Is that thing like really, really, really super loud or can you guys even hear it at all? Seriously, if you can hear that shit and if you can hear it kind of over me, let me know right now so I can do something about it. The alcohol content. Very good question, sir. It is 13% alcohol by volume. Uh, this is, ooh, matured in bourbon barrels too. You know what's funny? It says matured in bourbon barrels, but... I didn't, thank you, can't hear it at all, that's perfect, that means I can stay cool, just like Rodney Rodster said. Um, but uh, this uh, is bourbon barrel age, but it doesn't really taste super duper boozy, if anything, any booziness is coming from the alcohol content. Probably the fact that it's a three-year-old bottle, too, kind of mellowed it out nicely. So. All right. So, anyways, uh, let's talk about uh, the NAM show. Because I just got back from the summer NAM show a little bit earlier today. We flew out from uh, Nashville at 7.50 a.m. today and got back after a connection in Dallas, uh, got back here around, uh, I want to say it was like 1.15 in the afternoon, picked up the puppies, made our way back home, got a little bit of rest in, and I kind of got this uh, set up for us to have a little fun. Um, but I have some very, very interesting thoughts about Summer Nam. Before going to Summer Nam, this was my first Summer Nam, by the way. I, for those of you guys that may not know, or hell, for those of you guys that do know, that see me there all the time, I do go to Winter Nam uh, every year since 2014. So I, I've been there quite a few times now. Had a blast every single time. Um, a little bit less so this year. Um for those of you guys that may have uh, been there and seen me there, or been there, wow, good beer. For those of you guys that were there at NAM and may have seen me there, you may have seen me looking a little bit off at Winter NAM this year, and that was because I was feeling like really ill the whole weekend. I wasn't really able to get shit done. Uh, I mean, I only got two videos done the entire time I was there. I just couldn't concentrate, had a lot on my mind. We had just moved to Austin. Um, and also, let's just be honest, a few of my friends that uh, I normally see, I didn't get to see this year. My wife and uh, our friend Helena, that usually come out to Winter Nam, they weren't there either, so that also uh, was something that was kind of playing into my mood a little bit. Um, so yeah, I didn't exactly have the best of times this year at Winter Nam, um, but I figured, you know what, let me give it a good shot at Summer Nam this year. Uh, aforementioned Helena, she actually lives in the Nashville area, so we had a place to stay, like, hey, this is a good opportunity to visit Helena, so let's just go to Summer Nam, check it out. Everyone kind of told me that Summer Nam, the whole thing about it is that it is ridiculously different 
compared to uh, compared to the winter NAM in that there's not nearly as much stuff. It's a much smaller space. The um, uh, yeah, a lot, lot less products to check out. A lot less people there. A lot of people said that there's a lot less rockers there. It's much more country and worship musicians, that sort of thing. Um, but that being said, it was actually. Uh, but that being said, it was actually uh, a really, really, really awesome experience. It was something where, uh, honestly, I was just kind of able to chill through the whole weekend, get a whole bunch of stuff done. I've got a lot of videos that I'm going to edit. Um, some of them I might not edit based upon what the content was like. I might just opt to just discuss a few things here. But, um, yeah, there was a lot of stuff that uh, I was actually able to accomplish at Summer NAM that I wasn't really able to at Winter NAM. So being able to talk to people and talk actual business to people was really, really awesome. Um, being able to, you know, have actual meaningful conversations, being able to get the videos shot. Uh, I know I'm saying a few things over and over again, but that's because it was really, really just, um, uh, it's just something that I was extremely appreciative of. Uh, Rodney, you just asked if NAM shows are open to the public. The winter ones are not, uh, although it sure seems like it on that Saturday. But uh, the summer one is open to the public on Saturday, but it doesn't really feel like it. Like for those of you guys that have been to winter NAM and have walked around on Saturday, you know that it is a motherfucking zoo on Saturday. You can't walk around without bumping into people all over the place. There's not really anything that can be done, especially on Saturday. You can't accomplish shit because there's so many people there. There's so many artists just kind of walking around. There's a lot of guests. There's a lot of the industry professionals too. But here at the Nashville show, so few people to begin with, and then... Honestly, there was hardly anyone from the general public that actually came in to the show. I mean, you saw a few families walking around. There was definitely uh, um, a few instances where I was kind of just bumping into people, but it wasn't anywhere near as bad as a Saturday at Winter Nam is. Not by a fucking long shot. Like, to me, the most annoying thing about... Uh, the Saturday at Summer Nam, the public day, was the fact that every so often you would see kids just picking shit up randomly, like, oh, hey, I'm going to play this drum. Boom, 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 boom. And goddamn, I just, oop. Sorry, I don't know if you guys heard that. I just got my dogs barking. Sorry, honey, if you're watching this. Um,. But yeah, no, I just, uh, it, it was just annoying as shit, you know, you see this little pudgy kid come running up like he's running up to a fucking Mickey Mouse or something. Hey, how you doing, Clark? And like, oh, I'm gonna totally whack this shit around and throw it all over the place, and it's, it's music gear, you know? E even though it might look like a toy to you, kid, it's music gear. And hey, mom, dad... Get your kid under control. Jesus fucking Christ. Anyways, rant over. Mm. But, so like, no, it was, it was, back to the point. It was cool to actually be able to have like a meaningful conversation with somebody for 20 minutes without getting interrupted by anybody. Um, it was great to check out new gear and actually get to spend a very healthy amount of time with it. You know, sometimes you can't really spend a lot of time with gear at Winter Nam because there's always other people waiting in the wings ready to try it out too. I mean, I'll give you for instance, one of my favorite things in the world at the Nam show is the Boutique Builders Showcase. Jamie Gold has done a fucking awesome job of getting 
uh, boutique builders out there that maybe we've never heard of before, or maybe even some that we have, but we've never had a chance to try out. You know, brands like Reaver and Oni Guitars and Padalka and stuff like that. Um, Red Layer Guitars, uh, a bunch of really, really cool stuff. And there's a bunch of ISO booths around um, the Boutique Builders Showcase at Winter NAM. But God help you if you want to go into one of those booths for any longer than five minutes at a time. Because literally all these dudes in their nice pressed button up shirts will be standing outside kind of tapping their feet, you know, what the hell's taking so long, you know, waiting to get in there with their $20,000 jazz box. And there's not really that sort of pressure to finish playing anything at Summer Nam. Like I can sit down for 10, 20 minutes at a time with this guitar, with this new pedal, <coughs> excuse me, to actually dive into it a little bit. You know, it's, it's just kind of refreshing. So I think one of the things that you guys might be picking up on is that there's a lot less people there. There's a lot less to bother someone who's really wanting to accomplish something at the NAM show when you go to summer NAM as opposed to winter NAM. And that is definitely the case. I think like um, as much as... Uh, What's the best way I can describe this? Okay, I think I've got a few ideas on how to fix Winter Nam. Because you talk to anyone that is in the industry, like at the, um, uh, at any sort of like guitar company or amp company or anything like that, um, any sort of, uh, uh, pedal company, any, anyone that's actually working for them, anyone that's working for distributors and wholesalers and dealers, anyone that's working for uh, marketing companies, media companies, that sort of thing. And they kind of all uh, seem to uh, converge on the same point. And I say all, like it really is all of them. Probably, a, 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 I would say a fair amount of them. For sure, pretty much everyone that I talk to about this at the show um, would tell you that, you know, that's one of the problems with Winter Nam is that there's just hardly any time or any sort of way to actually get anything done business wise because there's so many fucking people all around. So I've got a couple ideas, and they're ideas that were kind of floated by me. Uh, by a few people that I was talking to at Summer Nam, um, and I I kind of like either of them, but I think what would be a big help for Winter Nam is either a add an extra day at the beginning Wednesday, where it is totally not open to anybody except for vendors and dealers, uh, maybe marketing companies, uh, but probably not even the media yet. Let the media come in on Thursday, but everyone else go into, uh, go into things on Wednesday. No guests either. That's the big thing. A uh, few guys were telling me that they got ridiculous numbers of badges for the winter nam show and i definitely understand that a lot of what goes on at nam is a lot of people hanging out with each other and a lot of people you know maybe we haven't seen each other in a long time so hey what's up how's it going um and there's also a lot of just random people all over the place checking out the equipment so that they can later go on to all their online forums or Instagram, or, hey, check out this thing. You know, I, I really, really dug this thing. You guys should check it out when you have a chance. That sort of thing. There's a lot of uh, effort to get in word of mouth at this show, which 
is commendable. You know, they want to sort of still keep that sort of grassroots mentality of, you know, hey, this person, this person, this person, this person all dug this product. So maybe we should pay a little bit more attention to it as an industry. And that's cool. Or as the general guitar buying public rather. Um, but let's have a day where we don't have everyone in there at once. Just vendors, dealers, distributors, whatever. Just maybe like marketing firms. And I mean like actual marketing firms like, you know, hey, pay me money and I do the campaigning for you uh, to help get your gear into publications and that sort of thing. Um, but don't allow guests, artists, anything like that into the venue for at least one day. Now, what does that look like? That could mean either adding on an extra day at the beginning, adding on a Wednesday just for that specific purpose, uh, which from what a few people have told me kind of happens a little bit, but unofficially, uh, or just don't make it open to everybody on that very first day on Thursday. Let people do what they need to do on Thursday, conduct business. And then Friday, it can be this total zoo shit show that is the Winter Nam. And I say shit show like it's a bad thing. I love going to Winter Nam. I probably will always love going to the Winter Nam show. But it is fucking bananas when you compare it to the summer show. Um. So anyways, that's my hot take. I loved the Summer Nam show. I would probably say I honestly legitimately loved the Summer Nam show more than the Winter Nam show, with the exception of there's just nothing to check out. There's literally like a handful of cool brands, cool products there. Most of the big brands are just not there. So like to give you an idea. Uh, ESP, not there. Ibanez, not there. Uh, <laughs> Legator, not there. Strandberg, not there. Uh, Ormsby, not there. All the brands that we love to go and hang out at at the Winter Nam show, not there. You still have Fender, Jackson, Charvel, EVH, Gretsch, uh, Martin, Taylor, Alvarez, uh, Gibson. Gibson had a very, very large booth this year. Play authentic, bro. Um, uh, a few cool amp companies, Marshall had a booth there, um, but really just not a whole hell of a lot. And a lot of the brands that do have booths at Summer Nam, ridiculously smaller booths compared to the ones that you see at the Winter Nam show. To give you, for instance, you go to the Framus booth or the Kiesel booth, and they are ridiculously ridiculous monstrosities, monoliths that you can see from a distance. There's the Framus booth. Yay, I get to go over there and play all this great, cool stuff. At the Summer Nam show, it's a lot less extravagant and a lot less obvious, so you kind of have to search for it. Granted, that searching takes like two or three minutes because it's in such a small hall. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's... It, it it is what it is. It's it's just a different experience. Lots of lot less stuff there. Like I would have loved it a lot more if the thing would have been maybe twice as big. Because at the Nashville Music City Center, they only really take up the C and the D halls. And if they had enough companies willing to bring out new product willing to showcase new product at the Summer Nam enough to take up A, B, C, and D and still use that extra room that was across the hall where they had all the awesome Jackson, Charvel, and EVH stuff, then, uh, you know, I, I I personally would love that. Uh, yeah, Chris, imagine Leggett are going to Summer Nam, you know? And that's the other thing, too. Like, everyone says that uh, Summer Nam... There's like a lot more of like a country music and worship music contingent that's there. A lot less of the metal and rock crowd kind of wasn't like that this year from what a few people were telling me. Like 
don't get me wrong, there was still that contingent there, but it's not like you would look to your right and see uh, this incredible session guitarist who's played on every fucking one of the hot number one country albums, you know, uh, or look to your left and there's this guy that uh, uh, you know for uh, such country hits as you know, Mama Took the Truck or uh, Daddy Fucked My Sister, whatever those country songs are about. Um, but like practically none of them were there. Like probably the biggest, like most famous people that I saw there, like I saw Daryl from Genesis was there. But even he, like, he kind of blended into the crowd and didn't really have a big crowd around him or anything. No one was harassing him. Um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Larry Mitchell, I think, is his name. Uh, the guy that plays Nags uh, used to be with Michael Jackson's touring band. He was there. Um, but those were, and of, of course, like, YouTubers. Like, what does that say when YouTubers and, like, a handful of session musicians are kind of the biggest names there? Um, but even so, like, everyone always makes it out to be this big country and worship thing, and I just didn't really see that much of it. So I actually saw a lot of the typical kind of Nam crowd that you see from Winter Nam, which is the guys that, you know, like, kind of the... Um, the uh, rehabbed rockers, you know, the guys that look like li dried out lizards, you know, that you find behind your couch after they've been dead for six months, you know, Hey man, I still like to party, but now I do it clean. Take it from me. You know, those guys, there was a handful of them. They're beautiful rock and roll mamas that are all like 10 to 15 years younger than them. And uh, you know, uh, a lot of that type of crowd that was there, which was just really, really surprising. Um, it wasn't a bad thing at all. It was actually kind of cool. And it led to honestly, some pretty interesting little jam sessions that you would find all over the place and some great live entertainment, uh, that Friday night at, uh, the Mercy Lounge. That was actually a pretty cool show. Hmm. But yeah, it's just, you know, you, that, that's kind of the reason why you wouldn't see a brand like Legator at NAM in the summer is because it doesn't really cater to the typical group that you see at summer NAM. That being said, this year, well, it probably would have uh, played into them a little bit more, I think. You know, the, this was definitely not your typical... I only play Telecasters and Strats and Les Paul's kind of crowd. This was uh, definitely a little bit more like old school shredder kind of crowd. And there was a few cool brands that you would see around the place that had some interesting stuff to offer them. But there was also a bunch of stuff there that had no business being at that show whatsoever. You know, like there's always those handful of custom guitar shop booths that just like who the hell is buying that like it's not enough that they're trying to make a metal shape or like some crazy bc rich for the new millennia kind of thing but like kind of warped and off and picasso looking but why are they there at the country and worship nam it was really weird but um, yeah, it, I mean, I'm, I'm going off on a tangent. I completely forgot what I was even talking about now. Um, so, but yeah, all told, I think that we can fix Winter Nam by limiting access to us regular folks, the media and the guests, like by one day, like whether that means not allowing them to be there one day or allowing them to be there for all four of the normal days, but adding on a fifth day at the beginning, you know, whatever. But 
I, I think something has to be done for the Winter Nam show to kind of put it on that same level of awesomeness that is the uh, the Summer Nam show. I, I just, I really, really enjoyed the Summer Nam show. To summarize, the only thing I didn't like about the Summer Nam show was the lack of stuff to check out. Now, speaking of the stuff to check out, let's move on to stuff that were kind of highlights for me of the NAM show. And I see a lot of people in the chat talking about BC Riches. Don't get ahead of me. All right. I'm going to get there. But uh, a few things that I thought were really, really cool uh, highlights of the trip. So I already touched on it. First of all, that awesome kind of cover band set that was happening at the Mercy Lounge on Friday night was really cool. Um, Thursday lunch was interesting for those of you guys that saw on my Instagram. I absolutely fucking destroyed my intestines with Nashville hot chicken. And I did the macho tough guy bullshit thing and decided, hey, you know what I should do? I'm going to get the hottest fucking Nashville hot chicken that I can get. So I didn't go to Hattie B's uh, because uh, the person that we were staying with, Helena, she kind of thinks it's a touristy trap. So let's go someplace else where the real shit is. Okay, awesome. So we went to Party Foul, which is just down the road. It's right next to Carter Vintage Guitars and... They have this hot chicken there called Poultry Geist, which is fucking ridiculous. And I thought I had prepped myself because lately I've been getting into hot sauces, you know, through watching hot ones on YouTube and just kind of getting into that and um, like getting a few like Carolina Reaper sauces and actually developing a taste for them. Like, I love them, you know, especially like the Sweet Reaper stuff. And then you go in and try the Poultry Geist and you realized you have no fucking idea what you're doing. Like, you're, you, you think that having all this stuff with Reaper sauce is going to really prepare you for that. So Poultry Geist, um... I read up on it. It's Carolina Reaper, Trinidad Scorpion, Ghost Pepper, uh, Cayenne, and something else that I can't remember all blended together to make this fucking mishmash of destructive hot. Are you fucking serious? It's 3.6 million Scoville? Jesus Christ. No wonder I was in goddamn agony. Man, someone please look that up to make sure it, it, to check if that's for real. 3.6 million Scoville. Jesus. Oh, hey, Robert. How you doing? Yes. How are you? Robert, you son of a bitch. But 3.6 million Scoville. If it's that fucking much, Jesus Christ. Yes, chicken made with pure hate. Dude, Robert. He came up with that description at the Rev House Party on Thursday night. And that is like the purest way to describe how that chicken tasted. That thing was made with fucking anger, for lack of a better description. It was brutal. It was brutally hot. Definitely was not prepared for it. I still am proud of myself, though. I made it. Uh, through two and a half pieces of that shit before I had to bow out. I was like, no, man, I can't fucking do it. It's probably still in Helena's uh, fridge right now because we, we couldn't throw it out because what if the raccoons got it? <laughs> now, don't misunderstand me. It was good. It was goddamn tasty. But, man, was that shit way too hot. Jesus Christ. Um... The, uh, like I tried, my wife got the medium heat, uh, for the fish and I tried the medium heat stuff and she thought it, that that was too hot for her, but I thought that was just about right for me. So, um, no, it was, it was, it was delicious. It was just like a fucking 
punch in the mouth. Anyways, moving on. Other Nam highlights. Um, I loved the custom shop, or not the custom shop. I'm sorry, the limited edition uh, Charvel stuff. The um, the one with the kind of Vivian Campbell uh, artwork was cool. Um, but really, I was all about uh, that black, uh, that black limited edition Charvel that has the pit guard and the Floyd and the rails humbucker in the neck, the full humbucker in the bridge. My only complaint, and I voiced this to a lot of people over that weekend, uh, I really wish it had a reversed headstock. Jesus Christ, dude. Like, if it had had a reverse headstock, it would have been my ultimate super strat. Uh, easily maybe sold a thing here or there, get that for me, and I'm fucking good on super strats. That's all I want. That exact instrument with a reverse headstock. I want it to be a Henrik Dan has, uh, or I'm sorry, I totally just butchered his name. Good beer. Henrik from Evergrey. I really, really, really want for that to be his signature model because he's already got a custom shop, Charvel, that's just like that, but with uh, a relic white finish. Man, make please make a limited edition signature model pro series of that. I would happily splurge on that. So good. Mm. Um, besides that, uh I still, even though it's not as new, you know, I, I like the famous Diablo 2 that they just came out with. I really like that off-center uh, shape that they've got. Um, the uh... Hey, uh, Chris, so Fender does have a Stratocaster with a reverse headstock of Floyd and the Humbuckers. It's a signature model for a Japanese artist who I can't remember. Quilted blue top. It actually looks pretty cool. Not quite like if at this point we're getting into aesthetics. I would much rather go for that Charvel with that relic finish than the um, than that quilted blue. Just on a strat, in my opinion. Um, yeah, the new David Elfson was pretty cool. The new Volas were pretty awesome. Like, I'll be honest with you. The thing that I loved about the Volas were the fact that uh, they slimmed down that neck shape just a little bit. Because uh, they kind of heard a lot of people uh, kind of voicing their opinion about the baseball bat thickness of some of those necks. And so they trimmed down that C-shaped neck that they had, and it was so... So much better. I actually, I really, really loved those volas with the new neck shape and the uh, the roasted maple neck. Played so good. Um, besides that, like um, uh, the uh, high watt, five watt combo amp that they've got. Wow, massive tone for a five watt tube combo. Like Jesus Christ. That thing, not necessarily metal, but you could definitely record like a lot of leads with it. Good for recording for that stuff. Um, blues and classic rock on that fucking thing for days. But man, five watts and that was a tone monster. Uh, Aura Amps, a uh, company from Brazil was there. And they actually gave me, I've got their Crunchmaster pedal that I'm going to do a demo with on the channel, which was pretty cool. It's kind of like an actual crunch channel from an amp. It's not really an overdrive. It was a little bit more of like a crunch channel preamp, for lack of a better description. And then uh, I also got the Mud Killer, which is made by our amps, but it's electric eye audio. And I am looking very, very forward to trying this thing out for you guys as well on a video. Um, the uh, But uh, two things from our amps were really impressive. They have one uh, kind of preamp or distortion pedal that really kind of emulates a dual rec rather nicely. And it kind of looks like it too. Like if you go to Aura Amps website, 
A U R A amps and just look through their pedals. Look for the one that looks like a Mesa. You'll know which one I'm talking about. And the um, they also had a hand wired amp there that was a 46 watt uh, EL34 and 12 AX7 powered head that was very, very JCM 800 ish. Really, really, really nice tone out of that thing. I I liked it a lot. Um, speaking of amps, you guys ain't ready for what Blue Guitar has cooking up. So I shot a little bit of a video with it. I showed it to a few other people that I met there. Um, but Blue Guitar, for those of you guys that don't know, it's this guy. I'm probably going to butcher that last name because it's German. Thomas Blug or Blug or something like that. He's got a company that's just called Blue Guitar that makes these little pedal board amplifiers about this big and, you know, three buttons, but uh, different amps on their full EQ and presence and gain and that sort of stuff. You can tweak the settings a little bit, save them, etc. There's a foot switchable reverb that's on there. But his previous amp, 100 watts, does the rock and blues thing exceptionally well um, for being just like a little nanotube powered 100 watt pedal board thing. And like when I say it's a pedal board amp, I mean, you don't need a power amp. You don't need uh, really anything. You just plug in a speaker cab right to the pedal and boom, there's your fucking rig. And uh, he was telling me that it recently got demoed by a bunch of guys that were a little bit more metal oriented. And he really didn't think that it fit what they were doing. So he wanted to come out with something that's more metal oriented. So there's one that he's calling the Iridium that is basically the same concept, uh, th uh, four different amps, but it's not like, the previous one where like, okay, one of the amps kind of channels uh, Fender combos and then moving up. Now you're getting into like, uh, uh, like martially tone at its dirtiest. This was something where it has a really nice clean tone. The, uh, uh, what you want to call it? The crunch channel on it is like a pushed Marshall. So Awesome for maybe getting like some Ingve style tones out of it. The classic channel on it was more akin to like an angle kind of tone or like a hot rodded Marshall tone. Great for power metal or like newer classic metal stuff. Like the vibe I got from it was like newer accept kind of stuff. And then the modern channel on it was just molten fucking metal. Like definitely in that realm of like uh, just ultimate brutality. This thing is going to be awesome. Yeah, like Dietzel, Engel, KSR, that sort of stuff. Uh, this thing is going to be absolutely insane. It's coming out later this year. I've already got kind of a verbal commitment with them that I'm going to do a video on it because I, I really want to check to make sure that uh, the production models are going to be just as kick ass as this prototype one is. This prototype one knocked me on my ass. So I'm, I'm really, really wanting to check one out, uh, for you guys. So you can see, uh, if the hype is real and if this thing is like great for recording purposes and, uh, running it in through a cab for a room tone, that sort of thing. It was awesome. Um, Let's see, besides that, uh, Squire, the Star Classics, which are a fugly guitar. Um, that being said, there was one that they had there that was a hollow body, but a sealed hollow body. Kind of like, well, yeah, like a, um, uh, a whatchamacallit, a, um, what is this? Oh, I have no idea. Um, but kind of like those old like ES-335 studios from back in the day that Gibson used to have, or like any chambered guitar for that matter. I don't know why I'm going with that obscure reference. 
but like the way that it looked, it had active ceramic humbuckers in it. Yeah, they're going to be cheap because it's a Squire, but dude, I could totally see like some new school hardcore band or like noise core band or something like that really going to town with one of those things. It would look so fucking rad up on a stage. Um, uh, let's see what else. The um, the, 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 the shit. I had a whole long list. Um, let's see. There was a company there called Polymorph that had this uh, very very interesting reverb and delay pedal that had a touch screen and extreme customizability with the options there like it's not enough that you can just edit uh the parameters of the delay in full you can actually alter the parameters of each delay itself on this thing it it's really weird think about this concept like what if you were to play like a nice jangly chord throw a delay on it and what if you wanted the second delay off of it to be louder? You could do that on this thing. It was crazy. It was insane. You can actually adjust the EQ of just the reverb and just the delay itself. It was nuts. So, yeah, th this thing was fucking bananas. And it was, it's an Australian company, Polymorph, if, uh, if I remember the name. Mm. Let me address this real quick. Devin, there was going to be an ethereal on this channel at one point, and I don't know what happened to the guy that was going to send it to me. Like, he was going to have it sent directly to me from what I understood, and then all of a sudden he started posting pictures that um, he's already received it and everything, and I haven't heard shit from him, so... I'm just kind of writing it off that it's not going to be on the channel. So that's fine. Uh, moving on. So um, let's see what else did I like at this show. Um, speaking of Gibsons, I know that I've been giving them a lot of shit lately about the whole Play Authentic thing. And by the way, speaking of Play Authentic, since I've got 50-something of you guys that are watching this right now, Please, please, please go to my page on Facebook, uh, facebook.com slash Arnold Plays Guitar. The pinned post is a brand new t-shirt design that uh, New Wasteland Designs did up for me. I'm very, very pleased with it. Um, it it's called Play Authentic. Just check it out. Uh, I think you guys would get a kick out of it. Fucking hilarious looking. Uh and uh yeah support buy a t-shirt buy a hoodie it's available in a few different colors i uh, would love to uh see you guys sporting that on the instagrams and the facebooks so um and we're almost to the minimum amount so uh that it as actually is going to be made but i need to sell a few more excuse me while i pour a little bit more of this awesome, awesome brew. For those of you guys just joining me, I am having a beer that is known as Mocha Bomb. Black Damnation 2 is 13% alcohol by volume, and it is ridiculously chocolatey, a little bit smoky, um, a little bit boozy, even though it's aged in bourbon barrels, I'm not catching that so much. I'm catching more of a booziness from the actual alcohol of the beer, which is nice. Mm. Very, very nice. Anyways, so um, – but anyways, moving on to Gibson. Even though I've been giving them a bunch of shit for the whole Play Authentic thing, I got to say I love – the Kramer, uh, uh, the Kramer um, reissues that are coming out. The Night Swan is getting reissued. The Jersey Star is getting reissued. Um, very, very nice. And you heard earlier that there was a Charvel with 
a uh, kind of Viv Campbell color or paint scheme on it. Then the Night Swan's coming out. There's also an Epiphone Vivian Campbell Holy Diver model. So Vivian Campbell, it's kind of funny. There was like practically three guitars there related to him, which were really, really nice. Um, so Insane 8, don't get ahead of me. I'm going to talk about BC Rich, all right? Just let me get to it. Let me get to it. Um, like there were actually some Epiphone and Kramer things at the show that were really, really nice. So credit where credit's due. You know, as much as I give shit to Gibson, I've never really had a bad time with an Epiphone. So, I mean, even like the super cheap stuff, like the LP100, I thought was exceptional for the price point. So, but anyways, there you go. I'm going off on a tear with that. The, um, uh, besides that, th those were kind of the highlights of NAM in general. Um... And getting to see a lot of other YouTubers, guys that I know from GitCon that were there, that was really cool getting to uh, kind of catch up with Sean Daniel, uh, Hunter, or as you guys know him, Aggie Fish, and Steve from Boston, Pixie Licks was there. Jesus fucking Christ, that guy, when you're involved in any sort of conversation that involves him, he just lifts up the whole mood of the room. It's ridiculous. Like, he's one of those guys that just holds your attention. You don't want to interrupt. He's just super fucking funny. Like, and God help you if you get him off on a tangent because it is hilarious. Because he knows his shit and he will wax eloquent about it. And it is awesome. Um, let's see. Hmm. So, um, yeah, get, getting to hang out with all the YouTube guys and talk shop with them is really, really awesome. Uh, met Dovidas while I was down there too. That was really, really awesome. That guy is, uh, insanely talented musician. So being able to like talk to him was really awesome too. Um, getting to talk with all these people that I know uh, from Framus and Warwick uh, through GitCon or just from knowing them from NAMS previous was really, really awesome too. Uh, guys like Greg over at Vola, of course, Derek and Sam and the whole gang over at Rev Amps were really, really awesome too. Um, yeah, uh, Silas and Vitor and all the guys from Aura and Electric Eye Audio. Um, th there's there's too many guys to name that I honestly just had a really, really awesome, enjoyable experience with. There was a lot of guys that I met there at the various booths because, like I was saying, Summer Nam, you're actually able to get shit done and actually have these business talks. I didn't see Rick Beato there. No, I don't think he was there actually. Um, uh, that dude's a fucking beast, man. I love Rick. He is like, oh man, he makes me want to literally sit down and read instruction manuals on all this equipment, uh, as well as like sit down at a piano and really, really train my ear. That guy's on another level of awesome. But um, I digress. So... But no, actually getting to meet people from like Dunlop and High Watt and all these companies and actually talk to them, get to know the Spectre, get, getting to know them and like, you know, hey, my name is Arnold, you know, let's, let's talk business. Let's talk about getting your stuff on my channel. Um, met Adam Reaver while I was there too. And for those of you guys that follow FU Tone on Instagram and Facebook, Adam is seriously fucking cool in person that dude is awesome and i'm very very happy that um the next video is going to be uh that little uh all the stuff that he sent me like that little gift box they sent me a couple months back that had a, a big brass block in it for my framus um that's 
that's going to be cool. That's going to be the next video I do. Um, let's see. Uh, besides that, so let's move on to something that I thought was extremely gimmicky. And uh, for lack of a better term, it's just utter bullshit. Let's talk about the Gyrock. Let's talk about the Wild Customs, because this is a viral thing now. Steve from Boston shot a really kick-ass video. It's been shared all over the place. Pretty much guaranteed, if you're on Facebook and if you're in any guitar groups, you've seen this video of the Gyrock system, the thing that actually rotates the pickups in the guitar. So this is the concept. Part Like some German engineer partnered with Seymour Duncan, got these pickups thrown in to these little capsules that you can put in to the guitar and that rotate around. And there's these two big ass switches up here where a toggle switch would be on an LP style instrument and go up and down and you can switch between various different uh, pickups depending on what you want in there. There's lots of different capsules. You can have like normal strat style single calls. You can have rails. You can have tele style pickups. Um, no full size humbuckers, but there's a lot of Seymour Duncan made uh, like stack pickups and mini humbuckers that they throw in or single call size humbuckers, I should say, that they throw into these capsules that you can put in. Now, is this an awesome concept? It actually is because if you're like, I don't know, a, a backing musician or a studio pro or just a working musician in general, somebody that may need a little bit more variety out of one of their instruments and uh, obviously bringing anything made by line six with the Variax uh, is going to get you a bunch of shit sounds. So you want something that's going to sound a little bit better. This is probably going to be a lot closer to what you are looking for. Um, I do have some concerns, though. First of all, they are capsules. So you basically put three of these capsules on each one of these little rotating things, uh, these little gyros that are in there, and like the way that they connect is with basically like some prongs and my concern would be like swapping those out over time wouldn't that sort of like affect the electrical components in such a way that the connection isn't as good surely you could get in there with like some electronic contact cleaner and fix that up but why would you want to run that sort of risk you know like i think about my Schecter, for example, how right now it's got a Seymour Duncan Liberator that's in there so that that way I can do pickup demos on that guitar. And it sounds great, but it doesn't sound as perfect as it would if those pickups were hardwired in there and soldered into the guitar like they normally would be had that Liberator not been in. I've got the Liberator in there just for ease. But what if it was something a little bit more like, uh, or let me rephrase, but if it was something where they were actually hardwired into the guitar, the tone would be a bit better, you know, kind of akin to like how whenever you hear somebody complaining about how Kempers don't sound like real tube amps, kind of the same thing, you know, maybe 95, 98% of the way there but not as real as here's my amp, here's my speaker, and it's pushing air. Kind of the same concept, you know, like you've got this pickup that's kind of quick connecting in there, and is it really giving you 100% of that tone? I'd be curious to do an A-B comparison uh, of some instruments like that. Um something else too there are more moving parts which let's just be honest if there's more moving parts in an instrument that means there's more shit that's likely to break over time um that's 
just a fact of machinery and engineering that, you know, hey, you got more stuff, something's going to fall apart at some point, um, especially without proper maintenance, which, let's be honest, a lot of us guitar players, yeah, we'll change strings, we'll wipe them down from time to time, maybe we'll polish our guitar and make it look nice and pretty, but how often do we actually go in and sort of like fix everything as far as like electronic contact cleaner on all this, or like maybe resoldering something that doesn't look quite right, or uh, maybe taking a look at like the screws and that sort of stuff. How often do we go in there and actually fix that shit up? Or do we just sell the instrument like, oh, this is a piece of shit? So, and that's getting a little bit ahead of me too. So, this guitar um, has an extremely prohibitive price point. And some people know it already, but uh, here's a big question for me. What would the... I think I would rather go with Fishman Fluence, honestly, personally. Um, but actually, you just reminded me of something else. So Frank Falbo uh, mentioned something in a group recently that kind of rings really, really true. And it's especially funny considering that now we're going to talk about another Seymour Duncan pickup when we're talking about an instrument that uses capsules filled with Seymour Duncan pickups. So he actually said something like, hey, do you guys remember those years back when I invented P-Rails? Which, yeah, that's a really, really good fucking point. P-Rails, dude. That's literally the entire concept of the P-Rails pickup is that you've got a humbucker in there. You can get single coil tones. You can get P90 tones out of there. You can get a few different tones out of the thing and at a much less expensive price, which brings me to this. So for those of you guys that don't know how much these uh, wild custom guitars are, and I think this is more due to the contraption that's inside, wild customs, in my opinion, is a very very worthwhile brand to buy an instrument from. They're actually really, really solidly built. I don't know anyone that's owned one that has anything bad to say about them. Doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, but I've never heard anything bad about them. Um, Chris, if it's 3K, they can fuck off. Oh, <laughs> if it's 3K, it might be worth it. And that's what I that's the point I'm trying to make. If it was 3K, it would actually serve a great purpose with studio pros and backing musicians that need a little bit more versatility out of just one guitar. But it is not just 3K is the problem. The amount of money that you would be spending on this Wild Customs Gyrock instrument is the same amount of money that you would spend on a brand new 2019 Honda Fit. And for that kind of money, get the motherfucking Honda Fit because at least that can take you to and from band practice or whatever. You're going to get way more use out of that Honda Fit than you will out of that guitar. I guarantee you. 16000 fucking dollars for that thing? Dude, if you're like me and you like the expensive stuff that is honestly well worth it, but still it, it's got a price point, a certain price point attached to it. Like for that amount of money, you can get three to five really, really kick-ass, amazing instruments with great pickups, great components, exceptional wood, just and built to fucking last. Or if you're one of those guys that really loves the cheap stuff, dude, go hog wild for 60 grand. You can get fucking like $16,000 guitars all with really, really incredible pickups from Seymour Duncan, DiMarzio, EMG, Lace, whoever the fuck you actually like. Uh, but you can get that many instruments uh, like that all give you different tones, different sounds. For that kind of money. 
like I just don't see this as being anything worthwhile to own. In fact, to be perfectly frank, I think it's complete and utter bullshit. And someone who shall remain nameless, someone told me that they were talking to a particular uh, a particular German engineer who I think might be the same guy uh, in Europe about a concept like this uh, that was very, very similar, who basically said that the whole reason why this thing exists is as like some obscure art project. Like, let's build this insanely stupid, expensive instrument so that we can see if people would actually buy it. And then someone bought one and they all of a sudden had the money to actually make them. Now, I, I, I'll be honest, dude. I'll, I, I think we are being played here. I think this is a bunch of gimmicky bullshit that no one needs, no one is going to ever use ever, and the internet is fucking falling for it. Hardcore. $16,000. Make sure that, like, that word gets spread out there because that is utterly pointless. <sighs> so, sorry, I'm just looking at a few of your guys' comments. Let's see. Kurt Ballou, yeah, that dude knows his shit with instruments. I mean, like, th this was a guy that used to use, like, first act custom shop stuff, which, yeah, you know, everyone knows first act, but they know him from the real shitty stuff that you would get at Walmart. That custom shop stuff was incredible. Um, but then, like, now he's using Wild Customs. I mean, the brand is fucking solid. And I would definitely still recommend checking out Wild Customs, but not this fucking monstrosity. I am sorry. Buy a real guitar from them. Um, so, like, the... Uh, um, a lot of you guys asked me earlier about BC Rich. And I will tell you that there's... Uh, I am looking very, very excited. Uh, I'm getting very, very excited about the new BC Rich stuff, to be perfectly frank with you. Um, I, uh, I'm sorry. Hold on one second. Da, 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 da. Why are you not fucking working? Okay. Oh, because I reached my maximum. A lot meant all right, fine, whatever. All right. So, anyways, with regards to BC Rich, um, BC Rich was not worth at or god damn it, you said you said not worth it, and you totally like I saw that and it totally fucked with me as I was trying to say this. That was hilarious. Okay, so BC Rich was not at Summer Nam. There was one person there that I'm aware of that uh, I talked to who is involved with the company. I won't name names or anything like that, but he filled me in on a few things, uh, not really going into too much depth or detail because obviously there's a lot of stuff that is, um, hey, Lewis, how you doing? Uh, dude, fucking awesome seeing you at the NAMM show, man. That was awesome. So, uh, dude, L Lewis is a class act. Um, we were just about to talk about the new BC Rich line that's coming out. For a long time, I wanted one of his, uh, Tone King BC Rich Mockingbirds. Was never able to get one, was never able to snag one. Now, because of the new BC Rich models coming out, I might get something very, very close, which is going to be awesome. But, uh, uh, dude, that, 
thank you, Lewis, for stopping by. That's awesome. Good seeing you. Um, so the, uh, uh, where was I? Oh, yes. So like this dude kind of filled me in on a few things and I made sure, uh, uh, I made sure to mention to him that, look, I've been a BC Rich fan for a long, 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 long time. You know, I'm a diehard metal fan. I love the association with them. You know, everyone knows that there's always been kind of a not awesome history with that company. And I've been reassured that the newer stuff is supposed to be substantially better. New ownership. Um, any old, uh, any of the old guard that was with the company before they, that was kind of cherry picked, like certain guys are with the new company now, and it's not, uh, necessarily as much of the same team, but going forward, they're trying to do the same thing that like what Halo was trying to do, which is to say that, Hey, we're revamping everything. We don't want to be known for our past mistakes. We're wanting to put out stuff um, that is uh, worthy of being called a world-class instrument. And uh, the new BC Rich stuff uh, is hopefully going to be indicative of that, especially this new import line that's coming out. So hopefully um, the contact that I made is going to actually allow me to have some of the new models on this channel. Hopefully, I would really, really like to see them on the channel. I'd really like to check them out and give you guys the full rundown on them. Because, like, dude, I, I love my BC Riches. I've got two of them here. My second and third guitars I've ever owned were both BC Riches from the Class X era. The Made in Korea line, the last Made in Korea line that they had to me were like the last great import BC Riches. So the fact that they're making them in Korea again from world music, I, I have a lot of hope that these things are going to be incredible. Um, the uh, There's a lot of reverse headstocks in there, which is something like when it comes down to headstocks, I think that a reversed BC Rich pointed headstock is one of the sexiest fucking headstocks that's out there. And to hear them tell it, like pretty much everything is going to be available with one. So like uh, a, a reverse headstock Warlock, I'm all about. I've got my Terrence Hobbs Warlock right up here, for example. Let me just grab that, actually. This badass motherfucker right here. Took me forever to get one of these. Always had a soft spot in my heart for a kick-ass warlock with the reverse headstock. From what I understand, pretty much all of the new stuff is going to have it. Probably not all of it, but dude, a mockingbird with a reverse headstock. Jesus Christ, I am all about that. Reverse headstock, Floyd and Fishman's, um, made at World Music. Uh, so they're they're going to be a little bit higher standard than. Well, let's be honest, they're going to be a substantially higher standard than that last Chinese made run that they did. Not saying Chinese made guitars are all bad, but that line that they did have that got shipped out to like guitar centers and stuff like that was kind of bad. So, uh, like actually getting made in Korea import BC Riches again is going to be absolutely killer. Um, I've been told there is an Iron Bird. I'm looking very forward to that. I hope that has a reverse headstock too and a Floyd. Um, there's a stealth coming out there again, reverse headstock, not a shoulder stealth though. There is going to be a neck pickup on it. Um, there's warlock bases and dude, if they, if there's a warlock base 
without that god awful widow headstock and with yet again a reverse bc rich pointed headstock i'm fucking all about it all about it oh i just really really hope that my hopes aren't dashed upon the rocks which is exactly why i want to get them on this channel i really want to play a few for you guys give you the unbiased review treatment and let you guys see if they actually hold up to our hopes with these things i just man i i love B, the bc rich stuff because of how synonymous it is with metal music in general i mean a lot of my favorite players have played bc riches over the years and uh like a lot of my favorite favorite records of all time were recorded primarily on those things you know old morbid angel stuff bolt thrower king diamond uh old megadeth stuff way back in the day um a lot of old dio stuff actually was recorded on bc riches pretty much any great classic black metal record old school death metal record bc rich is appearing on a lot of that stuff and still appears on a lot of that stuff and for good fucking reason because they're incredible instruments if not in terms of quality then for sure in terms of to look at but if you get a really really solid piece then it's fucking incredible it's totally fucking incredible um but that's why i want to get them on the channel I want to make sure that they are really solid pieces. I want to make sure that it's something that I feel comfortable adding to my stable. Like as much as I put in a lot of work and effort to get this Terrence Hobbs Warlock, I would sell it in a heartbeat to get one of those new ones if those new ones are up to snuff. So uh, really, really, yeah, Immortal, dude. Fucking Ironbird Bass on all that old stuff. Uh Cannibal Corpse, yep, the first couple albums, Jack Owens was playing uh, Mockingbird. Okay, so now, there's my thoughts on the BC Rich stuff. I've got a lot more thoughts about it, but I'm not going to go too in-depth with it. I want, I've, I, I want to save it for if I get a chance to review some of them on the channel. I've got, like, a whole thing I want to say about it um but fingers crossed guys all right let's go through some of your guys's comments since the last time i addressed y'all so let's see let's see uh the shredzilla you know the shredzilla looks really really cool i'll be honest i'm not as interested in that just because I'm interested in the fucking metal shapes. I think that Shredzilla is going to be awesome. I would like to think, you, you know what, you know, I'm not, I'm not even going to address uh, Bernie Jr. right now. So I'll, I'll save that for further down the road. Uh, let's see. The Iceman behind me. Yes, the Iceman is going to have an unbiased gear review coming up pretty soon. But I've got a lot of stuff I need to get through first. So I've got tons of pedals. I've got two different sets of pickups I need to do. Uh, I, when I say I've got tons of pedals, I mean like if I take a look around, I can probably find like 10 to 15 pedals I need to review like pronto. So a few of them I've had for a really, really long time, and I need to get them done. Um, the FU Tone stuff I need to get out there. Uh, there's uh, uh, even uh, a couple guitars here that I'm meaning to do a review of. So I just need to get – I'm way behind. I need to play a lot of catch-up. After being at Summer NAMM, though, I'm feeling very energized, so hopefully I can do that. Do that. Sorry. Hiccup, belch, whatever. Mm. Let's see. If 
Father Sludge, yeah. The World Music Factory is the same factory that the LTDs are made in, that the Ormsby GTRs are made in, that most of the Schecter stuff is made in. There's, uh, I want to say, uh, oh, God. I For whatever reason, I can't think of all of them off the top of my head, but there's a lot of great stuff that comes out of the World Music Factory. Let's see. Um, a lot of you guys are going back and forth about Kiesel's, which, whatever. Whatever floats your boat about Kiesel. So... I made a few comments recently. I will never, ever give Jeff my money ever again um, because he was quite a bit rude to me at Winter Nam. So whatever models they come out with, not interested. So that being said, you guys just get whatever you feel like getting, whatever makes you happy. Something that Glenn Fricker mentioned on his most recent video uh, cause he actually got a question, you know, like, is it still okay to like this or that? Here's the thing. Like you can like any guitar and you can own any guitar that you want to own. And anyone that decides to ridicule you for your decision is an asshole. Okay. Let's just be honest here. And I know I'm fucking guilty of that shit in the past. I know that there's a lot of other dudes that are probably even watching this that are guilty of that. You know, there's a lot of guys that if someone says, dude, I love my Legator, they'll jump down their throat. You got to stop doing that. If someone has a Legator or a Kiesel or a Gibson or fucking any guitar that they love, let them love it. Don't jump down their goddamn throat. There again. Coming from me, because I know I'm very, very guilty of that in the past. I'm trying to put a stop to it in what I do and say. Dudes, just like what you fucking like, seriously. Ah, oh, okay. When it picks on the see. Me, 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 and Kiesel. Me, 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 and Kiesel. Jesus, going back and forth. Guys need to get a room. Ironbirds are very hot. I really, really love an Ironbird. I would love it if they could make like a more, a more affordable version of the Igniter. That would be awesome. One other thing that I really, really like too is I haven't really seen a whole hell of a lot of the import BC Riches with that god-awful Widow headstock. Jesus Christ, I would love to take a time machine back like uh, 22, 23 years back and talk to John Schaefer from Iced Earth and tell him whatever you do, pointed headstocks fucking only. Do not get that very first warlock with the widow headstock because he's the guy that started it. So, oh, terrible. Anyways. Jesus Christ. Dude, I could totally see Jeremy H. buying an Iron Bird. Uh, huh, Father Sludge, yep. Would uh, release the Igniter. Yep, I totally agree. Upcoming ESP Baritone run from Axe Palace. I love Nick. I love the Axe Palace. But I got to be honest, man. I don't need ESPs in my life. Like, it's one of those things where I found other stuff that I just like more. And even though some of the stuff might be more expensive, like uh, the frame is stuff, even though some of the stuff might be um, a little bit more out there, like the Ormsby stuff or like the crazy import BC Rich line. Um, shit, what else? You know, the Solar stuff, Aristides, you know, I just like that stuff more than the ESP stuff. There again, if you dig the ESP baritone stuff, then fucking get the ESP baritone stuff. Be happy with it. Aliens did it. I wish BC Rich would get their shit together. Honestly, that's literally the vibe that I'm getting is from talking to the guy and from 
uh, mo- mostly from talking to the guy. I'm really getting the idea that they finally like trimmed the fat a little bit and they know what they need to do to right the wrongs with the company. They, they're very, very vocal lately about the fact that they're maintaining a presence in like all the BC rich chat rooms and groups and forums and that sort of stuff, trying to make sure that they are staying on top of what people that are into BC rich actually want so that that's what they come out with. And you, you gotta at least give a little bit credit for that. At least that sentiment that they are wanting to do something that does right by the people that want them to do right. Uh, let's see. Uh, comparison guitars. Yep, they're awesome. Okay. Thoughts on the Joey Jordison Warlock? You know, it's it's one of those made in Korea Warlocks. So, in my opinion, awesomely built. Uh, but for from that series, I like the Terrence Hobbs Warlock way more. I like the NJ Deluxe Warlock a lot more. A lot more. I have seen the Kemper stage floor model. I dig it, but it's, I just sold my Kemper. I'm, I've moved on. I'm back to tube amps. I've got this high watt that I absolutely love. I'm running in through a two notes and I'm getting the tone that I fucking love. Hey, Silas, how you doing? Was just talking about, uh, the mud killer earlier. Let's see. I wouldn't mind reviewing something from fast guitars either. Do I really dig Solar? I do. You know, I've I've owned three of them up to this point, and uh, the one that I've got hanging up over here is the model that has the uh, burl top and the Evertune on it, and it's one of my favorite instruments for recording with. It has some great tone to it. Playability is exceptional, too. In my opinion, it's the best bang for the buck at that price point. There's going to be a lot of people that can dispute that with me all you want, it's just my opinion. The Schechter stuff in that price point is awesome. ESP LTD stuff and E2 stuff in that price point is awesome. But I just really, really like the Solar stuff, especially how it sounds. Those Duncan Solar pickups are fucking great. Let's see. From Fortin. I'll be honest, man. I'm not the guy to ask from Fortin. Uh, someone like Yoko Skog or Jason Frankhauser is much uh, a, a much better resource for that. Let's see. Da, da, da. Uh. God damn, you guys are going at each other. You need to chill out. All right, seriously. All right, Shane, Jared, chill the fuck out. Okay. Oh. <sighs> God damn. Favorite death album? Symbolic, for sure. Uh, what do you think about Kiros instruments? I would love to review a Kiros on this channel. Um, never been in contact with them, though. To me, I think the price point is very, very interesting. I mean... American dollars, you typically see those things for around about the 2K range, which for a custom shop instrument, it's it's got the wheels turning a little bit. Might be pretty cool. Would love to check it out. Let's see. Is Fortin going to be a couple pedal trick pony? I have no idea, man. You know, I I'll be honest with you. I don't think of Fortin as a pedal company. And I refuse to think of them as a pedal company. Like the 33, the grind, I'm, everyone's got their own opinion on it. My opinion is I love the amps that Mike makes. And now actually being able to try out his own Ford and branded stuff, the prototypes from when he was with Randall, I said the prototypes, not the production stuff, but the prototypes from when he was with Randall, the stuff that he helped design with High Watt. Fortin knows his shit. He's right up there with guys like Kyle Rhodes uh, that just like are fucking high gain gurus and 
That's what I think of him as. I don't think of him as a pedal builder. I think of him as a fucking metal amp builder. And that's what I think people should think of him as. Like, people want to bitch about how much his amps cost. His amps cost that much for a fucking reason. Let's see. Ba -ba -ba -ba. All right. Let's see. Proud SG owner. You know, and there again, be a proud SG owner. If you've got a Gibson SG that's kick ass, fucking more power to you. You know, I want to tell you something. There was someone that I saw at uh at nam who shall remain nameless because i don't necessarily want him getting any sort of backlash for his thoughts or like a bunch of people like jumping on his back like oh my god that yeah you're absolutely right like i'm just gonna leave his name out of it but some guy was telling me that he's been kind of around north america uh at all these different dealers for his product and he's Always been a Gibson fan, but he's the first person to admit that there's been a lot of missteps as far as their products were concerned in the past 20 years or so. Like, he hates how they can't stay in tune. He says he's never heard, uh, or he says he's never really seen a headstock break, but he knows that it happens. But for that reason, he wasn't a fan of the stuff from like mid 90s up till now. But he was saying that as he was traveling the country, or the continent rather, going to all these different vendors of his brand's product and checking out actual 2019 Gibsons, he was really, really impressed. And more power to him, I actually haven't tried any yet, so I'm not going to comment on that. But he says that in his opinion, he thinks that those Gibsons are proof that quality control standpoint, maybe they've turned the corner finally. But then they did a fucking PR move that defies all logic whatsoever. Definitely defies all business smarts uh, with this whole play authentic bullshit. So, and the boutique partnership thing, which you know is just going to turn into some fucking legal fiasco down the road. But... Uh, moving on, moving on. So, uh, let's see. Thoughts on Ivana's advertising veneers as tops? I'm going to be straight up honest with you. I am less concerned with veneers versus tops as I am with Ibanez's shitty fret work. All right? On J Customs? Are you shitting me? You're going to put out J Customs with the vine inlays and those beautiful flame maple tops and have fretwork that can cut cheese on a $4,000 guitar? Get the fuck out of here. Let's see. What else? Uh, have I ever heard of Evergrade? Dude, We were just, I was just talking about that. At NAMM, one of my favorite guitars was that limited edition Charvel. And, man, I, I just wish they would have made it relic white with a reverse headstock and called it a Henrik signature model. Favorite Converge record? Don't have one. Uh, it's one of those things where Converge... Um, Jacob said something in an interview at one point. I don't even remember what the fuck it was, but it kind of left a bad taste in my mouth. Um, and I've just never really been a fan. So, I mean, you know, I, I've i never really dived into them, but based upon how that interview was, I was just like, man, I don't really want to. Uh, favorite amp at Winter Nam 19? I would probably say that uh, that Iridium amp that's coming out from Blue Guitar. Why did you sell the Kemper? I got a High Watts uh, Custom Super High 50 that I am fucking in love with. Dream Custom BC Rich Build. Um, dude, there's so many great shapes. The problem with me is that it would be easier to pick uh, the materials than it would be to pick the shape. Because I love so many BC Rich shapes, 
but I would definitely go with mahogany body, mahogany neck, maple top, uh, ebony board, reverse headstock, Floyd Rose tremolo. Um, for pickups, it's kind of interesting. I played a lot of interesting stuff lately. I've got Lawler DBs in uh, my custom shop Framus. I'm sorry, excuse me. Um, I would actually probably go with Duncan Custom 5 in the bridge and maybe an Alnico 2 Pro uh, in the neck just because I really love how both of those pickups sound. It would, it's, it's much, oh, and uh, really, really, really uh, kind of dumbed down the electronics. Just master volume, master tone, uh, maybe a five-way blade switch so I could get some a uh, single coil action out of that thing. Not that I would probably ever use it on a BC Rich, but just to have it. But the, uh, like, it, it would be much harder to actually pick out a uh, shape. I love the Warlock. It's got a place in my heart. I love the Iron Bird. I love the Igniter. Um, I actually love the BC Rich Virgin because when you sling it up high and play black metal on it, to me, it just looks fucking cool. There was a band from Michigan called Summon back in the day that was kind of a black and death metal band. And I used to see them perform a few times uh, at Milwaukee Metal Fest. And their one guitar player, Zayfan, just looked so fucking rad playing uh, a BC Rich Virgin up there, playing like that super extreme music. It was great. Um, let's see, what else? 10S Guitars. Um, 10S Guitars, I'm not sure. I remember that there was a brand like that that was posting a bunch of pictures of other brand stuff and kind of passing it off as their own. I'm not sure if that's the same brand. I actually don't think that's the same brand. So, but I'm a little less, I'm a little leery of that brand. Uh... Thoughts on PV amps? I love the PV Ultra, um, but to me, that was the last really incredible amp that they made. Uh, I don't like the Triple X so much because to me, it's just all the fucking gain. Triple X2, kind of the same thing. The Joe Satriano model was, to me, just a Triple X with EL34s. And don't even get me started on the Invective. It's just nothing but mid range. So that being said, with regards to Triple X, I know a lot of other people have gotten some great use out of them. I know that they've gotten some great results out of them. Like, hey, Terrence Hobbs, for example. You know, I mean, fucking Suffocation's tone has always been incredible. So more power to him. Uh, let's see. Uh, how was the Kiesel booth at NAM? I refuse to go to it. Uh... What guitars are on your radar for the rest of the year? I'm really wanting to get a Lux Tone onto this channel. So if anyone knows them, let them uh, let them know that uh, I would really love to check them out on this channel. Uh, but uh, yeah, I I was really impressed with their stuff at Winter Nam, um, to the point where it might be a front runner brand for me for getting my own custom shop made. I don't know though, like I. I'm still on the hunt for that perfect hot rotted strat kind of guitar. And they are definitely up there. Uh, what could, uh, besides that, um, I've kind of made it a point. I really, really, really want to get my own personal Reaver this year. So playing the different ones at NAM each year, playing Chad's uh, when he and I used to live close to each other. But it's about time that I got one of my own. Thoughts on Blackheart guitars? Uh, that dude's politics kind of ruins uh, any sort of interest for me. Besides the fact that he's got some really, really weird um, uh, build decisions that he makes. Like, to put the bridge pickup, instead of like right here, he'll move it up to like here on that one model he's got that 
was just kind of dumb. Thoughts on Will Putney? He's badass. Um, why not just profile the high watt? Uh, honestly, because I wanted to actually buy the high watt in the first place, so I sold the Kemper to afford it. Uh, thoughts on Jackson Custom Shop QC? I think the uh, I think the Custom Shop QC is not bad. I played some shoddy MM models lately too, but it's been uh, the cheap stuff. That being said, the Misha models that were at Nam at Summer Nam were actually a lot better. So I'd be interested in checking out one of the newer ones with the roasted neck uh, on the channel. Let's see. Dylan from Damon S, uh, another guy who, honestly, like, some of the shit that he posts on his, like, Instagram and stuff like that, when he's not talking about his guitars, just kind of rubs me the wrong way. So, more power to him. Like, he pl he makes some badass instruments. I played a few, and I think that they're well-made. Um, I do have an opinion on how they play. But I'm not exactly wanting to get into it right here. Let's see. I would prefer an Uber Shawl over an original 5150 just because, to me, the original 5150 was one of those amps that records better than it sounds in the room. I know there's going to be a lot of people that disagree with me on that, but, man, I just, when I owned a 5150, I could never get it to sound good in the room. Uh, let's see, Fred Friedman, JJ Jr., no, but I would definitely be interested in it. Uh, how come I, I refused to go to the Kiesel booth? Because Jeff was an absolute dick to me at the Winter NAM show. Um, I don't necessarily want to get into it so much, but just, you know, I'm just kind of cutting it off right here. I've been very, very interested in actually purchasing a Kiesel over the last few years finally doing a custom order. I've never had a problem with anyone else that works for that company. And I want some, I want everyone to know that like every other person that I've ever talked to at that company has been awesome. But man, like, like the way that, the way that I was kind of treated in conversation directly face to face with Jeff at Winter Nam has made me swore off ever getting something from them. So I'm just going to move on. He's going to continue to sell thousands and thousands of guitars a year. Um, you guys can enjoy them as much as you want to, spend as much money as you want to on them. For me personally, not going to throw down. Uh, let's see. New power metal I've been digging. Um, I really, really am looking, I haven't heard any because I'm personally, re uh, let me rephrase, hold on. <laughs> I've heard some great power metal lately. The new Sabaton record that just came out Friday is awesome. I'm looking very forward to the new North Tail record because of the pedigree that's on that record. Like literally it's a super group of epic proportions to me. Um, and I'm actually refusing to listen to any of the songs <coughs> that North Tail have already posted because I would rather just get the album and listen to the whole thing in full, start to finish, and hear literally everything there is to hear about it. Um, so I'm, I'm trying not to spoil it for myself, basically. Um, besides that, I'm looking forward to the new Twilight Force on a related note, um, cause I want to see how the new singer does. Um, the new, uh, Rhapsody album was surprisingly way heavier than I remember them being back in the day. Like back when they were in like their Power of the Dragon Flame days, uh, or, our we play Hollywood metal days. Like they were a good band. They were a solid band, but uh, a little too cheesy in terms of not only the subject matter, but in terms of even the riff writing. Now they're like a legit, ridiculously heavy fucking band. That new album was pretty damn good. Um, besides that new battle beast was pretty decent. Uh, 
definitely uh they were better with like certain songs than others though not like a great full album though uh the new beast in black is absolutely killer and that cover song that they released as a bonus track uh it's about time someone did a metal version of no easy way out by robert tepper which was on the rocky four soundtrack that song has always deserved a metal cover i'm so glad someone finally did it um but yeah for power metal that's kind of what i've been into lately Let's see where were we at here um Washburn guitars. Um, I the the as far as I know, they're still around, still making stuff at the World Music Factory. I think. I hope. Um, you know, with regards to Randall and Washburn and that whole company in general, I think they just need to like, like restructure a little bit, like pull back and rethink a lot of like where their production comes from how their quality control is done, which artists they want to get on board as endorsed artists and signature artists. And they need to, they, they just need to kind of rethink everything and come back stronger than ever. Uh, did Jerry Cantrell really use Ubers? I always thought he used ecstasies. Let's see. Do I feel there's a difference between the 5150 and the 6505 plus? I feel like there's a slight difference. I feel like uh, the 5150 had a little bit more balls to it uh, personally, but uh, not so noticeable in my opinion. It would be very cool to see Iran on my channel. Uh, I've heard a few things about, yeah, but Ran is dead for now, unfortunately. Yeah, I would love, love, love for that brand to make a roaring fucking comeback uh, because the one ran that I have actually gotten a chance to play for an extended period of time was very, very impressive to me. The only thing I didn't like about it was to me, the fretboard wasn't rolled off at all. It was just like a fucking 90 degree angle on the edge of the fretboard, which the fret work itself was exceptional. So to me, it was just weird. Like, okay, you've got these nice, beautiful rolled off fret edges, but the board itself isn't rolled off. And it just seemed a little weird to me. And it felt a little weird. Uh, let's see. Let's see, yeah, Chris from Kiesel is awesome. Brandon from Kiesel is awesome. Thoughts on EVH amps? I think they're solid, but uh it is what it is they're one of those kind of super meaty high gain amps uh that does in my opinion sacrifice a little bit of definition for oomph which is great if you're into that sort of thing like perfect amp for like a hardcore or metalcore thing but for the kind of stuff i like to do not so much have you or do you know Steven's amplifier? Uh, I can't remember who someone offered to send me a Steven's pound cake at some point, but from what I understand, they're like really, really hard to come by and are they even made anymore? So I'm not sure it would be something worth it to like check out on the channel. Uh, Stoner Doom metal records. Absolutely none. Uh, just not, and more power to you if you dig it. It's just totally, totally not my jam. Uh, be cool to see you go to our, I ran on this channel. Uh, let's see. Less gain, more playability, more note definition, really. I like, see, this is one of the reasons why I got 
the high watt in the first place is because it's, uh, for lack of a better description, it sounds like a JCM 800 fucking another JCM 800, for lack of a better way of describing it. It's just the most ridiculous, fucking brutal JCM 800 I've ever heard in my life uh, in terms of the tone. I know the components are going to be different, but it's just got that like super thrashy breakup, like the low end on it. You know how you hit a palm mute on a lot of high gain heads and there's a little bit sort of hmm, like hmm, that kind of goes into the palm mute. Like there's just a slight bit of like, like several milliseconds worth of like buildup to that fucking low end with the high watt, that low end is fucking immediate. And that's part of the reason why I like it. You can crank that son of a bitch and just get the most ridiculous thrash metal tone with lots of note definition, lots of note definition for death metal too, which is probably the reason why if you're going to summer slaughter, uh, you're going to hear something really, really incredible. Speaking of that high watt custom, super high 50. So yeah, get your tickets to summer slaughter. Uh, Mesa triple crown, you know, I've heard it, but I haven't actually played through it and I've heard it enough to know that in my opinion, it's worth it. Let's see, I, you know, to call it a modded 800, I would say that that's doing it a disservice. It doesn't sound like a modded 800. It sounds like the most ridiculously brutal modded 800 ever. Uh, like, it sounds like a modded 800 when you don't engage that fourth foot switchable gain stage. Then it sounds like a modded 800. When you add in that extra uh, gain stage that's in there, it just takes on some other fucking level that's so good. So good. So, anyways, gang, we're coming up on about two hours. I think this is a good place to call it at. Thank you guys so much for checking this out. Uh, no more questions. No more questions. We're moving on. Uh, lots of stuff to come. I've got videos in the pipeline, lots of stuff that I need to catch up on. Um, there's basically, uh, about maybe like 10 to 15 pedals here. I need to do several pickups, several guitars. Um, I also need to finally finish recording my, uh, kind of death thrash EP. If you guys are into bands like, uh, the haunted at the gates or, probably a little bit more closer, Do Scented or Hate Sphere. That's going to be kind of the vibe that I'm going for on this thing. So I'm, I'm loving it so much uh, that it might not even be an EP. I've actually been writing uh, a few more things. So who knows? Maybe, maybe an album? I don't know. We'll have to see. I'm still debating on that. But... Uh, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's coming. There's, uh, yeah, I'm rambling now. I gotta go. I gotta finish this beer. Uh, I literally haven't done anything since I've been back from getting off the plane. So probably maybe go play some video games or maybe even look up how to do this stream a little bit better in the future. So take it easy guys. Thank you so, so very much for tuning in and, uh, I, I appreciate you. Thank you.